Hey guys, it's me Kim. So in this video, I am going to be talking about the latest episode of Blackish. Now, it's so funny. I feel like this channel has turned into a colorism channel. Um, this is probably gonna be my last video on colorism for a while, but look, once you start talking about colorism, you just can't stop. And it just so happens that while I'm in my colorism mode, Blackish decided to uh, release an episode about colorism. Now, I am not uh, an avid viewer of Blackish. I don't dislike the show. I just don't watch a lot of network TV. It's just not my preferred tone. But Blackish is a good show. So, why do I think Blackish decided to do this episode on colorism? One, first of all, everybody loves to talk about colorism. I say this all the time. One of the reasons why videos on colorism do so well is because everybody has a colorism story. Everybody. No matter where you are on the spectrum, if you're a person of color, you have a story and everybody wants to tell that story. So one, relatable and people will tune in and be engaged. Two, Blackish has a history of doing these really topical episodes, right? A very special episode about racism or police brutality. Um, I think they did one about slavery or reparations or something like that. I mean, you know, like I said, I don't watch watch this show, but I hear about them. Three, and I think this is an important one and maybe one that we aren't all gonna acknowledge, but Blackish has participated in the sorts of colorism that we often call out in the media. Now, I like everybody on the show. I love Grownish. I'm a grown ass woman who loves the show Grownish. Yar Shahidi is adorable and everybody on that show is so cute. But, you know, Blackish is a show where the dad is black, the mom is biracial, also love Tracy Ellis Ross, it's not personal. But then you have kids on the show who are portraying black children, like children with two black parents, but they don't have two black parents, and it's obvious that they don't have two black parents. And then the dark-skinned sister is the mean one, she kinda evil, she's always plotting, and the mom, who is dark skin, is like hypersexual. And first of all, obviously love Jennifer Lewis too. But like, there is a certain thing going on with Ruby and with Diane and Blackish, right? And it's not to say that black women don't, or black girls and black women can't be those things. It's just real interesting that the characterizations of the darker characters, particularly the, the female characters, align with our stereotypes about darker black women, right? And so I do think that a part of this episode is to give them a little bit of cover. I'm sure that they've gotten a lot of pushback. And so um, I read a, an interview with the director and the writer or maybe it was the showrunner. Anyways, it was on Shadow and Act. They were saying that the writer, I think of this episode, is South Asian. And he was talking about how this is a really relatable topic for people all across the globe. Um, but of course they are not going to acknowledge that you y'all kind of fell into that trap too, right? Like you're perpetuating certain myths and narratives about um, darker skinned women too. So let's get into this episode. What went right? What went less than right? I really thought the setup for this episode was really, really clever. It was not cliche. I didn't roll my eyes. Where's Diane? What? Right there. <gasps> oh my God. What's wrong, babe? Yeah, that's Diane. Oh my God! In other days, you never could have guessed where you'd end up. They OJ'd my baby! Good job, whoever thought of that. I also appreciated it as a black person who grew up in predominantly white schools and has had to navigate predominantly white institutions. I liked the class 
photo setup because it highlights that this stuff is perpetuated in ways that are completely invisible, right? So it doesn't always have to be about malice. And you know, people are always like, and it's so annoying, people are like, my intentions were good. Well, it doesn't really matter if your intentions were good, if you're still perpetuating bias, if you're still perpetuating marginalization. And obviously, you know, that is what happened when Diane is the dark little speck in the corner of the class photo. I appreciated that. I like Blackish. I think it is so funny. One thing that I, when I was watching this show, I was like, this is a funny show. I don't love how there was so much explaining for white people. Now, I get it, right? So, like I said, I read that interview with the co-showrunner and the person who wrote or directed, maybe wrote and directed this episode. And he said, you know, Blackish's audience is 30% black. That means the majority of people who watch this are not going to be familiar with this dynamic in black communities and black families. So they're gonna have to dedicate some time to explaining this is what colorism is and this is what we're talking about and give them that foundation. For me personally, just me, as a black viewer, <laughs> It does take me out of it a little bit when we're talking about this thing that is so important in our lives and we have to make sure to insert that explanatory comma. We have to talk directly to mostly white people and say, okay, I know you're probably lost, but let me catch you up real fast. But despite the fact that I'm not really into that, I do think that they navigated that as, as well as they could have. Oh, I had a, I had a, a historical question. I wasn't able to look this up, but I do think that when we're explaining colorism to um, dumb it down to the light-skinned people were in the house and dark-skinned people were in the fields, I'm not sure if that's true. I'm not sure if that's 100% true. I need to go back and fact check that. In fact, I'm pretty sure that that's not true. And I think one of the reasons why, I think I read this somewhere, one of the reasons why black people continue to cling to this idea, light-skinned people in the house, dark-skinned people in the field, is because of Malcolm X? I'm pretty sure. I liked that Blackish was attacking this issue from so many levels, right? So we have it in the white institution, right? The white institution doesn't recognize that you need to like this little black girl differently. But then Junior comes in and says, yeah, like colorism is a thing in this family. That's what we do. Don't worry, if you can handle our family's issues with complexion, then you can handle anybody else's. What issues? If you're wondering why this feels like an accident about to happen, it's because colorism is something black families really don't like to talk about. I just meant she'll get used to it, you know, since we're all colorists. Whoa. I mean, especially <laughs> Dan. I love that because, yeah, it is insufficient to just point outwardly, you know. Now, I'll definitely still point outwardly, but absolutely, you know, in being in these conversations for years and years and years, damn near a decade, so many people have horrible, heart-wrenching stories about how the grandma liked the light-skinned cousin or about how their mom made fun of their nose or made fun of their hair or said, get out the sun or whatever. So many people are carrying that trauma from stuff that happened to them at home. And I feel like some of that trauma is like the most difficult to get over. I thought it was really real and relatable how initially Diane played down the whole issue. She was trying to ratchet everything down. I really felt that as like a kid who, you know, again, went to these white schools and your mom or, you know, your parent is on Tim because they're like, no, 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 like this, right, this is racism. And you're like, oh, please don't make a scene. You know what I'm saying? Like, my life is already hard. Please don't make it harder. Like, I really, <laughs> I felt that. If there is a critique of this episode, I think it is equating the way that light-skinned people are treated with the way that dark-skinned people are treated. And 
it's fuzzy it's fuzzy and it's hard right but I did kind of feel like we were going in that direction where they were saying colorism is anytime you talk about skin tone and so I actually understood what Junior and Rainbow were saying about the light skin jokes thing it happens every time we talk about this we get jokes. Calm down, team light skin. It's all right. Yeah, it's just jokes. Thank it's you, Mom. You guys constantly do all the time. Team light skin or half Nubian queen or, oh, you guys come from light skin Sylvania. Don't you? Or me looking like Raven Simone with the fade. <laughs> guys, come on. We're talking about jokes, not oppression, jokes. Well, if it's so harmless, Dre, then would you mind if Junior and I just start making a couple dark skin jokes? Come on. A dark skin guy. I dare you. It did make me think like okay so despite the fact that if i make a joke about a light-skinned person being soft or whatever or you gotta wear sunscreen or whatever it's not oppressive you know it's just mean it's not oppressive but also like why do we just want to be mean we are taking the liberties to be mean and to nitpick and whatever because we feel like life has been so hard for us or you know we get it 10 times worse or whatever but i don't know what do i really get out of if it makes you feel bad and, and i see these comments all the time in fact there are like channels on youtube about where light-skinned women just come together to talk about how mean we all are to them <laughs> and you know i roll my eyes at that but but there is something to be said for we can just be nicer. We can just be nicer. If, it don't, if you don't like me talking about your green eyes, then I won't talk about it. It's like, not that big of a deal. I'm not saying that's okay because it's not, but I did not choose to be born with fairer skin. Mm. Still people act like we created the problem. That's why we can't tell jokes, but you can. It's like but you're saying we're not really black. Now, I wasn't exactly sure when Rainbow did the, well, it's not my fault, I didn't choose to be this way, I'm still black. Like, I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be a critique of what light-skinned people say, or if she was really saying that earnestly, or if the writers were having her say that earnestly to make a real point. I wasn't sure, but I definitely wrote down, you know, I always have notes because that's what I do. But I definitely wrote down like, mm, this is what white people say, you know, like, like, if you're ever in doubt, stay away from what you hear white folks say, because that's not, that's not the way to have a productive conversation. Okay, so we're moving on. We've, we've moved out of this kitchen scene and the episode is progressing. So Junior is mad. Obviously he and Rainbow have commiserated over their light skin tears. <laughs> oh, it's probably not nice to say light. I'm trying to, if I just said that we need to be nicer to light skin people, then I probably shouldn't diminish what they're saying by calling it light skin tears, okay? Um, so Junior is up to his room. First of all, this house is fucking beautiful. I haven't watched the show in a long time. They live in a great house. Dre goes and talks to Junior and Junior said something here. This is why I'm so, I am impressed by how much stuff was packed into this episode. You and me, we're cool because I know you didn't really mean those things you said back there. No, I meant what I said. Hey man, I'm not a colorist. I love light skinned people. Yeah, you love light skinned women, but you think light skinned dudes are soft. No, I just think you're soft. I said, ooh. Oh, this is getting juicy! And he was talking about how lighter skinned men are coded as effeminate. They're coded as weak. And in a society that for better or for worse prizes masculinity, puts an emphasis on masculinity, that values men in how they're able to perform and portray masculinity, I'm sure that that is hurtful and also we see light skin men say this all the time right it's not just junior saying that there's such an interesting conversation to be had about the dynamics between how a light-skinned man is treated and perceived in the world versus how a light-skinned woman is treated and perceived in the world and generally like they're similar but the consequences of that are so different and interesting and then we move back to diane and that's where we see diane really engaging right so before she was like y'all calm down and now she's 
really reflecting on her experience as, you know, the dark skinned girl that has to have her hair straightened because she doesn't have naturally curly hair like Bo or like, um, what's the daughter's name from Grownish? What is her name? I can't remember. But anyways, Yara Shahidi. And it really reminded me that we think that we are protecting kids from all of this nastiness by not talking about skin color, by not talking about race or racism or sexism or all of this stuff. Like you think that you're doing your kids a favor by shielding them from the ways of the world. But when in reality, they are out there experiencing it. They recognize inequality. There's so many studies about how children recognize racism. They recognize inequality, even if they can't articulate it. They see when different groups are being treated differently. And this show for me underscored that you have to have the conversations early. Like before it even becomes a thing, you have to address it and broach it and give kids space to figure out what are these feelings and what is this phenomena and you know how can we fortify ourselves to face it because it's not it's not going away it's not going away this is also where I said oh Marseille Martin is good that is a good actress I'm excited to see little now she's really good in this show I think it was layered it was nuanced and her little facial expressions I like her I like her I also liked how in that little vignette with Diane, we again see that it's coming from all over. So we've already gone over that it happens at school, that it happens in families, but it also happens out in the world. And white people, of course, are going to play into it because, you know, they claim to not know no better but black people. So when she's at the makeup counter and the dark skinned black woman with natural hair says, oh, that's not for us. I hear people all the time say that other black women have said, you can't wear that color. You can't wear that color lipstick. People that you know, people that you don't know, people on the street, right? right? We feel entitled to project this stuff onto people we don't know. And a part of that is that fictive kinship thing where all black people, we're, we're united. We're in the struggle together. You know, I've had people I've never met ever in life make comments about my body. And even if they think they're praising my body and I should be grateful for that praise, it's like, you don't know. Like my body dysmorphia could be acting up today, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, I think that we should be more cognizant of how we speak to black people we don't know. Back to my issue. I appreciate that we're highlighting all of the inputs that we're getting all over. The lighter skin is better inputs, yes. And there was a little a little sequence in there where Dre talks about the structural stuff like prison sentences and whatever. And again, I get it because you cannot cram all of this stuff into this is like 22 minutes. I watched it on ABC.com. So all the commercials were gone. So you can't cram all of this stuff into 21 minutes, but it is important for us to, you know, yeah, black people do it and white people do it and schools do it and the prison system does it. But we also have to talk about unequal power, being intentional about discussing the difference between an interpersonal interaction and a structural interaction. That's really, I don't know. We missed that a little. We missed it, but that's okay, right? We only had 21 minutes to work with. That's okay. And Bo says, I'm gonna go talk to her. And Ruby is like, no, no, no. Not, it's not for you, hun. Like, no, no, no. You're out of your depth here. And then Ruby and Bo get into that back and forth. Uh, you know, it's a little bit over dramatic, but I understood the point, right? So I think it's really, this reminded me of that clip from the Campbell show with Erica Campbell and her daughter, Krista. My face is brown. <laughs> it's a combination. That's something too. A lot of the guys like light skin girls. Like what? 
A lot of the guys like light skinned girls. Look at our family. Look at our family. You and dad, light skinned, dark skinned. Auntie and Uncle Ted, light skinned, dark skinned. Auntie and Uncle Des, light skinned, dark skinned. The only two dark skinned, dark skinned families is Auntie, Auntie Lisa, Uncle Errol, and Nan and Grandpa. If you don't have the same life experience as somebody, it is, I absolutely think you can do more harm than good by going in and trying to counsel them about this experience that you haven't lived. I almost feel in some cases that bad advice and bad counsel are worse than no advice. Because then you will gaslight people. And it's like, you know, on that show, Erica Campbell was basically telling Krista, no, it's all in your head. What do you mean? And it's like, no girl, it's not all in her head. This thing that she's experienced is, is a real thing. And not to come down too hard on Erica Campbell again, but it's just, that's a learning experience for us, right? Like kids are young. They don't have um, the data set that we have, but they're not dumb. They're not blind. And I liked taking seriously the experience of a child in this episode of Blackish. Like, I liked that a lot. Jennifer Lewis, when she pulled out the family album and talked about the horrible things that her family had said to her. I used to feel different too. You see? I was the darkest one in my family because my people were Creoles from Baton Rouge. They were all light enough to pass the brown paper bag test. Well, until my mother met my father. They were evil to my father. And they were even more evil to me. Loved that. I also like the emphasis on this being um, intergenerational trauma. It doesn't just spring up one day. We learn it from somebody and then we pass it down and it gets passed down and passed down. And then in addition to that stuff that gets passed down just familially, then we're also getting all of these inputs and these signals and these messages from outside of us and it just compounds. I also have another note on here that says colorism is not bi-directional. Colorism is a structural force. It's an outgrowth of white supremacy, right? The same way that racism or white supremacy are not bi-directional, neither is colorism. That's not to say that hurtful comments or ideas about light-skinned people and dark-skinned people don't exist, that we don't trade those hurtful comments or whatever, but the consequences of colorism are borne out by dark-skinned people. Those are the people who shoulder the consequences of colorism. Now, I'm sorry that the dark skinned girls were mean to you in middle school. I am, I, and I'm not even trying to be, um, I'm not even trying to, to minimize this, right? I am sorry about that. I am sorry that people called you weak and beat you up or whatever. But that is not the same as what dark skinned people go through in this society. And we're not gonna be able to come to any kind of understanding if. We're not willing to listen to light-skinned folks, and I am. I know a lot of dark-skinned people who are not, though, right? Like, like, look, I see it. So when people say that there's no space for light-skinned people to talk about the, the hurt that they've experienced, look, I get it, because I see people shoot that shit down all the time. I'm not for that. I think everybody has pain. You know, I have pain about stuff that other people will think is a privilege. And that's real pain. And I go to my therapist and we talk it out. So I, I don't wanna say that that pain doesn't matter, that it doesn't exist. And I wanna give people space to work through that, you know? And my final critique of this was, and I know that this is a, a network sitcom, so it has to end on that high note, you know, we gotta, you know, go down and then we gotta go up at the end. Um, but I didn't love this idea that like, how do we fix this problem? We fix it through loving ourselves and hugging each other. But as I looked at my multicolored black family, I realized that because we talked about it, our wounds could finally start to heal as we learn to love ourselves out in the open because nothing gets better in the shadows. I don't think so. I don't, you know, I don't think so, but I understand why we had to do that. We had to wrap it up, 
21 minutes is a short time. You had to wrap it up. You know what? Blackish is a good show. It is a good show. Shout out to everybody who watches every week. It's well acted. I thought the writing was fun and funny and clever. Uh, I like this episode. I don't have any, you know, I didn't hate it. <laughs> I did not hate it. So that's all I have to say about that. Again, thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. I appreciate you. There's a bonus video up on Patreon right now. It's me talking about the myths about black women having bad attitudes and being unfeminine and not being submissive enough or not being invested in traditional gender roles or whatever. One of the essential parts of of being a black woman is realizing that you're gonna have to be your own lifeboat. You're gonna have to put on your own oxygen mask, be your own life vest, you're gonna save yourself. I talked about that, I talked a little bit about my feminism, I talked a little bit about those hashtag light skin tears. <laughs> so go over there and check that out. Of course, it's patrons only. I'm also going to be uploading a new episode of the podcast only on Patreon really, really soon. Um, buy some merch, leave a comment, send me an email, join the email newsletter. I appreciate y'all, really. I really, really do. <laughs> Bye, guys.